When we talk about suspension, we often talk about valving and shim stacks. But what is a shim stack and why would we need to revalve our suspension anyway? And is a pro tune something us normal riders actually need? Well, let's head to California and find out from Fox. So before we head to California and speak to Fox, let's just explain what valves and shims actually are. Because in virtually all modern suspension, both shocks and forks, you will find a damper inside. It looks a bit like this, so this would be in a fork. Now inside this damper will be oil, and that is there to control the rate at which your suspension moves. And in order for this telescopic part to move inside itself, to move through the oil, you will need a valve with holes in it so that it can pass through. But also changing the size of those holes in that valve can control the rate at which it moves inside itself. We can make it easier or harder to move and therefore change the damping characteristics of that damper. And also on top of a valve, you usually get a stack of shims, so circular discs of metal that can flex and control the way the oil passes through the holes in the valve. And that further tunes your suspension and how it feels. Now that's where we get terms like light tune and heavy tune as we control how easy or how hard it is to move that damper through the oil. So do we need to be mucking around with these shims and valves after we've bought the suspension? Or should we just trust the manufacturer? Let's head over to Fox in California and speak to Sergio about it. Sergio, thank you so much for having us here in You're Fox welcome. in California. Yes. Uh, I think this is a perfect opportunity to get people understanding what's really happening inside um, suspension and shocks. So you have different tunes for different bikes, obviously, and you will work with uh, frame manufacturers to come up with the right tune. So how do you go about doing that? One of the first ways is historic, and that's obvious. Obviously, the bike hasn't changed or has changed a little bit. But if they decide to reinvent the frame, for example, uh, one of the major things they like to mess with in mountain biking is the kinematics of the rear end, and that's the leverage ratio. And so. In mountain biking, they're as varied as the stars. And so mountain biking, because I think it's multiple disciplines and all of the variables that exist in cycling, there isn't one stamp like what I'm familiar with from moto. It's quite varied. And then you throw in the anti-squat characteristics. When anti-squat is basically when you pedal your bike, the pedaling motion works to either extend or compress the rear end. We take that data from our OEs and we align it with either previous tunes that we've worked with that we know are successful, or we get their bike and then work it in the field to optimize it. But it's that kinematic that's the roadmap for what we can expect from any particular bike. And then we get in the field, the other component that we end up picking up is the rigidity of the chassis. And I think that's when some of the fine tuning bits really start to benefit the end result. And how much do you think people need to worry about buying off the shelf shocks um, when their bike has a custom tune? Do they need to be going and getting a custom tune on their new shock to match the old one? Or would, it, would anyone really notice? I would say that's, that certainly is a very good question. It would depend on the ability of the rider, but if you want top performance, yes, each of these dampers is tuned to a specific kinematic. But depending on how you ride, it may or may not be a penalty. We're all about performance, and we would say you'd be crazy just to bolt some random shock onto a, a bike. Sometimes you can find some magic combinations out there, but I would suggest understanding where your bike is coming from and relaying that information, because we do have channels inside of Fox that can help the aftermarket industry get the right type of tune in there. And one of the things that happens is they may be older technology and then now the shock they buy is newer technology. And what we try to do is line up that need and give them an improvement. So you shouldn't shy away from it, but I think understanding how your bike is set up when you initiate that is gonna yield the best result in the end. We often hear this sort of term pro tune. Um, so how does that, well, if we talked about Greg Minar, for example, um, how does he go about getting the right tune? How do you work with him to get that tune right? 
that <clears throat> that role is primarily handled by Jordy's team, so okay. I'm sort of watching about that on the outside. <laughs> but what they're doing, and this is very similar to what it is in Supercross racing for me, is the regular customer will have more general statements about deficiencies in performance. Somebody of the caliber of Greg Minar is going to point very, very specifically at a specific point, which makes the tuning solution a little bit more obscure. It's a little more challenging, actually quite a bit more challenging, because they're not talking about a big footprint. It's just this little moment in time that they're having an issue. So you really have to be very good at understanding what he's saying and turning that into a reality. So I think what happens with someone like Greg Minar, the intensity goes up. He has a setting that he's familiar with. And for him to do what he needs to do, that bike needs to be familiar. So even though looking at his bike, you may have some wondrous ideas about what he needs, you can't really vary too far from what they want and expect them to be able to perform at the highest level. And I've seen it before where you, a team will drive a rider to a certain way because they have a fundamental belief and that rider doesn't perform or, or, um, or flounders, let's say but really giving them what they want is, an extra, is exercising us and our ability to really return what they want, and that's the challenge. So now as the PPT, this team interacts with racing. We're currently out with Nico Malali in North Carolina and his team. We've been testing for three days, but applying these methodologies to them, what they found is exactly what I mentioned. The OE is more generally concerned with the handling, where Nico has really pointed down and stretched the ability of the tuners. And it's been quite wonderful because that learning experience has accelerated. It's been quite wonderful. So how important do you think it is for the everyday rider to consider a retune on their bike, if I, at all? I think it's important for the regular rider to really run through the basics of setup. And that begins with SAG. And, Nine times out of ten, when we come across a rider in the field, and we come across them a lot, they come by the truck when we're testing. That's the first thing we find wrong. And it's a little bit frustrating because it is one of the most simple <laughs> adjustments, but you set your sag front and rear, and you get that dialed. And then you bracket the adjusters, and that just means moving the adjusters to their range. And there's some stuff online about bracketing that you can look at. But you want to hold one of the adjusters while you manipulate the other one, and then vice versa to understand the range of adjustability in that damper. And if you've done that and gone through and you're still unhappy, then I think it's time to really start considering a custom tune uh, setup for your bike. Now, one of the big changes on your new Grip X and the uh, Grip X2 uh, and the Grip SL mm -hmm. um, is that you've changed the, um, the shims in there. You've given more space for more shims. Um, tell me a bit about that, like why you did that and what that allows for the new damper. So there's just some magic that happens when you have a lot of valves. There's an, an interaction that exists that there's actually damping inside of the valve stacks themselves. And so that's one component. But the reason that we did it here specifically is the details that we need to get into. When I'm testing with you, for example, when you have some kind of issue, say you're entering a corner, you hit the brakes and it's going in too deep or it's not going in deep at all. When I have seven shims to pick from, if I move one of those pieces, it has a pretty significant impact on all the other velocities and all the other forces that are generated. With a lot of them, I can go in there and pull one out of the 23, for example, and it doesn't affect the other areas. So what we want to do is identify, for example, your problem is low speed, entering a corner, it doesn't settle enough. The high speed's fine, so when I make that change, I want to make sure that I just target what you're after and leave the parts that are good, otherwise I'm going to mess the whole thing up. With 23 valves, and it isn't a magic number, it's just a lot more, I would say 46 is even better, 70 <laughs> is even better, because it's just like a fraction, 1 7th versus 1 23rd. That's really the, like, the number of the precision that you're going in and doing. And maybe the regular guy doesn't need that level of detail in, in their writing, but to get the setting to be global, that's when we needed that level of sophistication in there. And with that was one of the early indicators that Group 2 was limited. Like we started needing more space in there and we started falling short and finding compromise. And engineering was saying there's no room boom, they went bigger, and then there it was, and we just filled that up as quickly <laughs> as we could. And it was really not just 
throw all the shims in there. Lucas Hart is the one that did the primary development work on there, and he found his way to more shims, and it got better and better and better. So it was really what we believed in theory and from my practice in motorcycle racing, applied to a bicycle damper and it lined up line on line and it's given us really fantastic latitude and precision and tuning. And the cool part is with that many valves, if you are gonna get your stuff valved, now you can pick from there and not impact the general performance of it. But I encourage people to understand the capability of their damper because we've worked really, really hard to make it so you can cover the range. And I, like I said before, if you find yourself um, unhappy with your performance and you've run through the gamut of adjustments, then I think it is time to make an adjustment. And uh, so Fox, as a company, background is motocross, you as well, yeah. background motocross. Is there some like real massive differences between motocross setup and tuning to mountain bike setup and tuning? Um, as much as people tried to convince me that there was, there really isn't. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's funny, it's even the same. As a suspension technician, what you're looking at is what's the wheel doing and what do I want the wheel to do? And so add two more wheels to turn it into a car. I worked on the PBG side and did side-by-side -side work and some asphalt work. It's the same thinking. You're looking at the driver, he's telling you the wheel is doing something he likes or doesn't like, and how do I get this thing to move easier or make it more difficult to move? What velocity, what position? So the thinking is actually quite similar. I would say with a bicycle, obviously the big difference is pedaling, but all of those physics are the same as a motorcycle. You just have a throttle versus a pedal. So for me, I could close my eyes and I wouldn't even know the difference. It just doesn't smell like gas. <laughs> <laughs> so technology has really moved on with suspension. And even when we saw the recent RockShox Charger 3.1 damper released, we know now that the window of tunability on a fork is so much broader than it ever was before. And maybe we don't need to be mucking around with valves and shims, but the option is certainly there if you fit outside of an average rider's weight or ability. Um, but let me know what you think. Let me know down in the comments below. Have you got a revalve, a shim stack tune? Um, what did you get and did it make any difference? Let me know down in the comments below.